open source is not a business model. And that when they build a business around the open source, they need to very clearly define the business strategy around that. So having a very successful and, and um, virally spreading uh, uh, open source is fine, but where is your value? Hi, this is your host, Sopin Bhartia, and welcome to Tier for Let's Talk. And today we have with us Dotan Horowitz, Principal Developer Advocate at Logs.io. Dotan, it's great to have you back on the show. Thank you, Sop. Great to be here. Yeah, and today's topic is around open source. And as the theme was suggested, that open source is more than a license, uh, which is totally appropriate for today's discussion. And I think one of the reasons we, I mean, I remember my early days of journalism. Uh, I started as an open source journalist and um, I met all these luminaries back in 2005, Jim Zemlin, and Mark Shuttleworth. And it was a new word to me. Back then our idea was, you know, why companies should op use open source? What are the benefits? Look at 15, 20 years. Uh, most of the companies are now using open source. The word runs on open source, but it feels that companies don't even know why they open they use open source, how they can become good uh, open source citizen. At the same time, as the business has grown, we have seen a disturbing trend where companies start with the uh, open source license, and then when it gains momentum, they change the license, which becomes incompatible. I remember early days we used to worry about, hey, is this license compatible with you know, GPL v2 or not? And now it doesn't even matter. It's a very, very difficult word. Uh, lines between, you know, what is open source and what is not open source, uh, you know, LLM2 and all those things, it becoming very, very difficult. So I want to just hear from you to just give us a broader, high level overview what you are seeing in the market industry communities today, where you're seeing the lines, you know, between open source propriety or open core are getting blurred. Yeah, so we, we see that definitely. Uh, we've seen that in the past couple of years, uh, for sure. And uh, more so even lately, uh, probably all, all of your audience has been aware of uh, the uh, Terraform relicensing, for example, and other projects uh, uh, in, uh, in the HashiCorp family. Uh, so, and we've seen that in the past as well. We all remember probably MongoDB and uh, Elastic and, and uh, Confluent and, and others. So, uh, as you said, you can uh, worry a lot about licensing, which most of the people do, but then the licensing can actually change. So you, you can find the licensing that are appropriate for you, and then one day find out that the licensing of the project has changed. That's um, one of the things. We can see other things in the... Uh, uh, in the industry that are uh, peripheral, that are not just the relicensing itself. Uh, uh, we can talk about uh, things such as, um, uh, for example, if you look at the uh, uh, repository where you keep the uh, uh, your, your own assets, like the uh, registry. So the terms of service of a registry can also be a significant change. Uh, if you think about uh, the Terraform registry in, in the example that I mentioned before, uh, think about other registries, uh, as long as it's open, you can use it. That's one thing. But if the terms of uh, service change, again, a major change. Or we can look about the uh, Red Hat's change on the uh, uh, CentOS or more, more so the RHEL, the uh, enterprise, and the way that it's not a change of license, just a change of the way that the, the code is being released and what comes before what, and how CentOS is or is not compatible with uh, RHEL, and, and so on. So these sorts of, uh, of changes makes it uh, uh, more blurry, whereas before you knew this is open source, now you have also source available or Fox Pen source license, and you have all sorts of other flavors that are open core, obviously, like, like Redis uh, model and others. Uh, so it's, it's a more complex world these days, as you said. If you just forget about all of that, and Let's not look at the definition of open source or free software by FSF or, or OSI. What is the goal of open source? What is the basic idea of open source? So I, I think this is the core question because people get really confused, especially these days. And so source available, is that open source? Is that not open source? Because people say open source. So open meaning that the op source, is, source code is open and I can access it. But that's actually not uh, uh, open source. That's source available or Foxpen source license. So the term actually is free and open source software, FOSS, as, as you probably well know from your experience. But the free part is very important because what is free? 
in free and open source. So as we said, it's not free access to the uh, to the source code because you have you have uh, the source available for that. It's also not free of charge. People think about the cost. No, you, you have community uh, additions for many of the the proprietary products as well. So the free, I think, it, it comes to the essence of the freedom uh, uh, to use, to modify, to redistribute uh, the software for any purpose without restrictions or discrimination. And that's, that's the really uh, differentiation of open source from all the other alternatives we mentioned. How much do you see people understand about open sources? Or you're like, they do consume a lot of open source there's a difference in the open source user and those open source consumer. Consumer is a one-way traffic. User is a two-way traffic. So how how much awareness or education you think that this is there or we are going back to 2005 where you have to start educating people, hey, you know, what is open source and why you should do it right? I, I find myself uh, very surprisingly going back to the basics of what is uh, open source, what is free and open source software in many discussions. Uh, in many forums, uh, and uh, yes, the question becomes comes back again, uh, but in a different form because there are so many variants and so many things that are uh, similar but not exactly that. That are challenging, by the way. Even the professionals, you look at the OSI, the Open Source Initiatives, struggling to to find its position. You look at the at the CNCF, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, needing to issue responses uh, to uh, Grafana Labs relicensing or to to, uh, uh, to Elasticsearch uh, relicensing and others because it's so heavily used, by the way, by other open source projects. So the impact of these moves is not just commercial impact and, and a business risk for companies. It's also a, a risk and an issue for other open source uh, projects within the open source community itself. I think if, if I'm a... Um, a project, and I'm an Apache 2 uh, licensed project, and I use a, a, a pro, a, another tool or another dependency or library, and that library suddenly changes from Apache 2.0 to a non-open source license, that's a no-no. I can't carry on using it. And even if it changed to another open source license that is not uh, enabled, so for example, the CNCF does not permit using AGPL version 3. So when Grafana uh, tool changed from Apache 2 to AG, AGPL version 3, that was a, an issue to many, many projects utilizing that project. So uh, this is a main concern, uh, both for the open source community and for businesses where it's an actual business risk. Let's look at the role of some of the organizations, you know, CNCF, which is part of Linux Foundation, of course, OSI is also there. Uh, how much they can do or what role they can play in addressing some of these challenges. Of course, you know, Open Tofu was a great example where, you know, the whole user community came together uh, to kind of find a way around the license change by HashiCorp for Terraform. So there are a lot of things going on, but in general, what are you seeing there? What will these organizations can play? Yeah, Open Tofu was an amazing example. I, I escorted the fork of uh, Elasticsearch into OpenSearch that took like six months to reach the first version, the GA. And uh, with, with Open Tofu, it was so fast. And I, I've been in touch with the uh, uh, founding members. I even had a, a, a them on my show to, expose, to provide more exposure to this initiative and get more people on board. And that, that's amazing. And closing the loop also with the Linux Foundation and making sure that this is being adopted by the Linux Foundation as, as, a, as a, its own project. So uh, really a great example that um, I'm curious to see how it evolves, but a very good start. Um, now, foundations, for those who, don't, who are not familiar, this, this is a, a different creature. So uh, both from vendors and also from single maintainers that create very cool projects in their basement, but still you have the risk of a one-man show or uh, someone you know, flipping the, uh, the, on you one day and you don't have the project. With the foundations, it reduces a lot of that risk uh, thanks to the fact that you have, uh, the project is actually owned by the foundation, a vendor neutral foundation is the legal entity owning it, not any of the vendors, uh, no matter how heavily involved they are within the project. So that's about the legal side of who can actually decide to change the license. And secondly, it's about diversity. You have vendor neutral ground and you have very clear governance uh, uh, behind around the project to make sure that there's no single entity that will grab control and there are very clear governance uh, that will balance out all sorts of per potentially conflicting interests 
uh, and making very transparent who can become a committer, who can become a maintainer, who can uh, become an approver of, of PRs and, and so on and so forth. So a very clear process. So I think this is the main value of uh, foundations with regard to these risks. And uh, above uh, that, there is also other additional uh, benefits such as uh, encouraging collaboration between the different open source projects underneath, under the same umbrella of the same foundation, the cross-pollination between the projects and between the maintainers that are actually part of one forum, one Slack workspace, if you want, if you look at the CNCF's massive Slack workspace, for example. So uh, it's, it's a really powerful way to reduce the risk. I'm not saying it's, it's a, a foolproof, a bulletproof, but definitely uh, reduces the risk tremendously. Now, the next question I'm going to ask is a very tricky question, and it could be sensitive as well, is that if you look, we have been talking about FSF and OSI, and if you look at some of the most popular licenses, they predict whether it's you know, GPL V2, V3, uh, AGPL or, you know, a lot of other OSI approved licenses, they were written in the age when we used to write and distribute software. We will download it, we'll run on our own machines, uh, where the whole point was that if you are redistributing, if you made changes, I want to see the changes back. When I talked to Linus, he was like, you know, I only thing I care about is if you have made any changes that improves my code, I want that change back so I can further improve it. Uh, and that is also the idea behind it. But the challenge in the cloud-centric or SaaS world is that nothing is being distributed. Everything is running on my own server. You are just accessing service from my own server. So I'm not even compelled or bound by the license. So actually, I'm not violating any of those licenses. Of course, a GPL can be challenging, but others are not. And sometimes we hear this message, you know what, these big cloud vendors are, you know, using our services so we cannot compete with them. And that's why we are changing license, restricting their usage, which goes against the whole idea of open source that we talked about. I had this discussion with Stefano also at uh, Open Source Summit from OSI uh, about the license change that do we need instead of these companies keep coming up with their own licenses, which are obviously not OSI approved and not compatible with other licenses, should we come up with a license which is more suitable in the cloud world? Uh, so do you think that we need to come up with a license which is more suited for the modern world? So licensing is a very subtle thing. And to be honest, I'm not a lawyer, I'm an engineer. So I don't know if I'm the most qualified, especially if you had the chat, chat with Stefano, the executive director of the OSI. But what I can tell you that the, there is a very large uh, uh, range of open source licenses within the OSI, including you mentioned AGPL. So AGPL does have a section that discusses about accessing the software via the internet, via networking, which is exactly the SaaS uh, uh, use case. So definitely, I think there's a lot of uh, room to maneuver within the uh, OSI, and maybe there's, there's room to uh, fine tune that. But I think the core issue here is not about the licensing. I think the core issue is that, that the, these founders that are so excited about open source and they realize open source is the go-to way and they start from day zero, many of them, around open source and they get the viral uh, uh, effect and everyone using the open source, but they don't realize that open source is not a business model and that when they build the business around the open source, they need to very clearly define the business strategy around that. So having a very successful and, and um, virally spreading uh, uh, open source is fine, but where is your value? Is your value around uh, providing services around uh, the open source? Is that value around creating a, a commercial product, uh, an enterprise uh, level one, a hosted version of the open source, uh, or, or many other ways? So the, the, it, it is very clear, and this is something that I find myself day in and day out talking to young founders starting in new ventures, that they need to pay extra attention to setting the business model for their company and making sure that the open source provides its own differentiated value Okay, it, it has to stand on its own right. It can't be that if you use just a one and a half or three nodes and suddenly you need to start paying or something like that. If, if you castrate, so, so to speak, the, the open source, developers will immediately uh, uh, go away and look for alternatives. It needs to provide value on its own right as an open source. And then, in addition, you make sure that you have your unique value proposition on top of that, very clearly distinguished from 
the open source. Actually, the most of the projects out there on GitHub are actually single individuals. And j- just not to sound like I only talk about vendors and vendors are evil. No, vendors are not evil. I work for vendors as well. And uh, and, and everything is fine. And also these indiv- passionate individuals that uh, compose their own uh, uh, open source in the basement, I tell them, by the way, the same advice. If you decide to open source your project, don't expect material compensation out of that. Uh, you have lots of ways to uh, to earn your your bucks from uh, from code development, from software, from uh, uh, these things. But if you go down the open source path, don't expect that material compensation. And we've seen issues with, with uh, single maintainers that realized at some point that it's such a heavy burden. And on the on the other hand, they haven't seen any income from the open source, and they started getting frustrated because all the Fortune 500s are using. I don't know, look at the log4shell, the uh, vulnerability that just showed what extent the log4j2 uh, is being used and it's two maintainers around that project. So for individuals, I'm saying the same. Don't expect material compensation with your project. If you decided to go for the open source path, realize that and either uh, uh, accept that or you can find a lot of work, by the way, including uh, for pay uh, developers in open source. Some companies pay uh, open source developers to work for them, it's fine. But or go down the path of, of setting up a vendor entity around that, like uh, the around like the around Kafka, the folks from uh, um, uh, what's their name? I uh, forgot their name that uh, started the startup around the Kafka. Um, anyway, so lots of examples there uh, around the M3 and, and many other uh, the ex Uber guys and, and many others that started the, their own company around the open source that the, the company spun off. But but don't uh, be confused. You need to determine whether you want to start an open source or if you want to go down the the, uh, money earning path, two different things. If you look at the general trends that are going on in the industry, do you see that the trend is becoming really disturbing? Whether we look at the whole miscommunication around Red Hat and CentOS or HashiCorp business source license. And before that, a lot of other things happened in the past where you're like, hey, this is a disturbing trend, or you think, hey, you know, these things always happen in past. If you look look at the whole SQO, SQO and all those, you know, the whole uh, lawsuits and everything else happen, uh, the whole, you know, Samsung versus Apple happened, Microsoft was anti-Linux, but now they have become, actually, I was joking that, actually, Windows is the biggest distribution of uh, Linux these days with WSL2, you know? Uh, the desktop Linux joke is here, Windows is the Linux desktop today. Uh, so, so the point is that you feel that, no, these are minor events. They will keep happening. They have been keep happening in past. We should not worry about it and focus on helping those individuals or companies who do want to build an open source ecosystem. Or you're like, no, those disturbing trends are going to have affect the larger open source ecosystem. I'm not worried, to be honest. I, I think it's an evolution. I think uh, maybe uh, we're, we're maturing up as a co- as a community and as a, an industry. So maybe before there was more of a romantic uh, a view of open source and more uh, a, a binary way of saying you're either open source or proprietary. And today's world is more complex and you have more uh, shades and more uh, flavors around. Uh, but I think it's ultimately... Uh, maturing up as a community and as an industry. So as I said, we need to realize, we need to face the fact, especially in an industry that is venture back to a large extent, and you have the, the financial pressure to deliver financial results, which are always short term, whereas community is the longer term play, obviously. So we need to balance out the community and the business uh, incentives. I, I don't expect it to change. These pressures and the, the, these conflicts will carry on being and p- the different startups and businesses will need to balance them out. I think as an industry, we need to, as I said, realize better how we build out sustainable business models around open source and maybe make uh, uh, licensing options more elaborate to accommodate different models uh, and having these foundations stronger and more of the larger vendors taking part. I think that uh, um, if you look at Microsoft's transition to Microsoft is uh, to uh, open source is an amazing example. I think AWS has been doing tremendous strides if I look at uh, OpenSearch and others uh, compared to what they used to do before that. So I think the realization also from the large companies that they need to pitch in and to also contribute back will balance out a, a more stable uh, way of handling open source uh, as an industry. What advice do you have for, you know, organizers, developer team, engineering teams, you know, let's 
go back to the example of Terraform, who were heavily relying on some of these technologies. Suddenly the business, uh, sorry, uh, the license was changed, which makes it difficult for them to continue to, to use or work with that project. Uh, so how, how they should evaluate a project uh, the earliest phase that, hey, this is a project that we can rely and build a company around which will be around for 10, 20 years. That is the first part of the question. Second part is that if they do end up choosing uh, a project or a product that is in a dicey situation and the license change happen, how they should deal with that. So there are two, four, two part questions. Yeah, so first of all, if you uh, need to choose a tool, uh, we all know uh, to look at the licensing. I think that you don't need me to explain. Find the license that is uh, most permissive and is suitable for, for your business needs. But don't uh, finish with ju- end with just the licensing. Go beyond that and try and understand who's behind the open source. Is that a, a one-man show, as I said, uh, uh, an aficionado there in the, uh, in the garage? It's a, it's, a, it's a single point of failure. Is that a vendor? Maybe the vendor can, uh, you know, suddenly uh, get you pull the rug from underneath your feet. So uh, if it's foundational, as we said, you get more guarantees. So these, who's behind the open source is very important. Also, what's the governance policy around it to understand who can uh, uh, who can uh, be, uh, be a committer? Can you, if I'm a competitor, can I become a committer if I'm passionate about this open source, but I'm a, a competitor of your uh, vendor company or not? Or will you block me? Will you block my commits? Will you block me from advancing up the ladder if, I, if I'm active and so on and so forth? So and ultimately, who can obviously relicense? Um, and uh, this is for, for uh, look at the whole picture, not just the licensing. That's what I say. And when you get to actually use it, also use it with the relevant mindset. So just like you uh, 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 treat, uh, you have the security mindset with, with software, same with licensing, manage your third party licensing exposure with the same uh, care as you do for uh, for security, uh, uh, do S bombs to analyze wh- what kind of dependent uh, uh, licensing you have down the stream with dependencies and others. Make sure that you don't have license contamination within your code. And also, when you uh, use these dependencies, do uh, treat it with care. We, I'm an engineer. We all like automation, for example. But treat it, be careful with using automation on your CI/CD pipelines. And upgrading these versions of the uh, of the third parties without putting uh, uh, safeguards and places where you check the licensing issue. Uh, if you suddenly the license changes and you automatically upgrade, you may find yourself in a, in a lot of trouble. So, with all due respect to automation, definitely uh, take care of that. Uh, and um, if you do find yourself needing to extend the functionality of the open source. Uh, do try and do that not by modifying the core code, which is the first thing that is gets blocked by relicensing, but try to do it in a pluggable way with you, via extensions, plugins, and so on, which is a, 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 usually a more relaxed way of doing that and is less exposed to, uh, to the relicensing change. Who can be hit really hard if such a license change happens? Uh, talk a bit about uh, what kind of industries those will be and what can they do to avoid any potential fallout from license changes on the project that we rely on? Obviously, this uh, license change can be a, legally a very uh, serious exposure to the organizations using that dependency or that library or that tool. Uh, and uh, for these organizations like uh, financial services, banks, government, or things like that, that want to just, uh, like any other businesses, to mitigate the risk and are willing to, uh, to put some uh, maybe bucks on that, but still want to work with the open source, they, they like the open source, then my recommendation, they can just go with distros. They can go with distros are like packaging of the upstream open source that are provided by vendors. And they come with, uh, obviously, the indemnification. So the vendor that provides the distro will take the heat in case of such a thing and will be uh, legally the owner of, of, uh, of that. And uh, that's one way. And obviously, it comes with additional benefits. They uh, provide uh, uh, support. They provide certification to run on specific hardware setups. So you get a more well-rounded version of the, the upstream open source. Uh, that's for on-prem. If, you, uh, if it's a cloud-based, and obviously, you have SaaS versions of the... Um, of the open source, uh, such as Logs.io that provides uh, Jaeger or OpenSearch or others as, as a managed uh, service. So 
Again, you get that as, as a service and you're not directly exposed to any relicensing and someone mitigates it uh, for you in the, uh, in the cloud realm. And uh, on that way, when you also uh, purchase these distros or these services, usually you also help uh, fund the open source because these are also ultimately the folks that they invest uh, and, and are part of uh, moving the open source forward. So I'd say it's also pay forward uh, in a way instead of uh, pay back, pay forward. Dutan, thank you so much for taking time out and kind of discuss this very complicated and sensitive topic in a very pragmatic manner. Thanks for all those insights. Thanks for great advice to companies as well there. And I would love to chat with you again. Thank you. Thank you. And may the open source be with you, as I say. 